Home Association. Always learn a lot. Good speaker. So welcome, right, thank Gordon. You. Appreciate thank it. Thanks for coming. Good afternoon, everybody. I think we got everything lined up here, so we'll move on. I think part of our objective here, I'm going to talk a little bit, Tom's going to talk, and Maria's going to talk, but we're going to, we're kind of whetting your appetite with the hopes that we can have some conversation when we get done with the, the very brief presentation. So uh, I'm going to start to talk a little bit about some of the issues with regard to concrete pavement joint distress. The uh, CP Tech Center uh, down at Iowa State is has been very involved with that for a number of years, working with the uh, National Concrete Consortium states, working with Federal Highways and others. So I'm going to give you just a little background on that, kind of show you some of the different distresses that we see around, and then focus a little bit on some of what I guess we would maybe call some of the newer distresses that aren't all that new anymore. But we've been trying to address those, and, uh, and we want to uh, just give you a little bit of information on that. So uh, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've uh, been around the industry for a long time. I worked for a paving contractor for about 15 years and then decided that was so much fun, why not work for 30? So I spent the next 31 years working for 30 paving contractors with the Iowa Paving Association. And, and now uh, I'm really pleased to be associated with the CP Tech Center. So just a little bit of history. You know, we've been building concrete pavements around this country for many, many years. Uh, we started our first ones in the early 1900s in Iowa, and uh, you know, right out of the bat, we really started wanting to know and understand more about concrete pavement joints. Our original pavements, we didn't join them. They kind of did their own thing, and we learned from that, and we went from there and tried to put things together. This happens to be a road, a county road uh, over in eastern Iowa that's still there. It was built in 2014 by prisoners from the, uh, the local prison. And uh, that was one of the first times that we really had record of actually using joints. There was no longitudinal joint, but they put uh, construction type joints at every 25 foot. But over the years, we've really tried a lot of different things to learn more and more about what, uh, what we can do with joints. Some other things that have come along with joints is in the 1950s, we started realizing that because of the freeze-thaw characteristics, especially in the upper Midwest area, that we, we needed to do something about air entrainment or something in concrete so the water had area to expand when you had the freeze-thaw cycles. So we started looking at air entrainment. Uh, decracking was another issue in some states. Uh, we certainly had a bunch in, in Iowa and some of the other states in the area have dealt with that over the years. The, the, uh, the uh, reaction of aggregates, the delamination of the aggregates in certain sources and the problems that that creates with, with joints has been a focus. And then in the early 1990s, we started to see some incidents of early joint deterioration. Uh, we was leading to more uh, research that was done on uh, vibration, issues with vibration possibly, some of the construction procedures, the air content saturation levels, and expansion of the paste uh, by, by uh, calcium oxychloride. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But what are some of the joint deterioration types that you see out there? Obviously, you see some of the materials related to stress. You know, the uh, decracking, which I mentioned earlier, which is in that left-hand picture. Uh, you know, the ASR, the ACR, and some of those expansive distresses that often occur at the joint because that's where you have the, the least amount of compression. And so it's going to expand where it can, so then you'll see that going on. Loss of load su of uh, support or load transfer. We built a lot of pavements back in the 50s and 60s that didn't really have any load transfer. We didn't use dowels in, in those days. And uh, so we were depending very much on uh, aggregate interlock in the pavements, which worked for quite a while. But if you had a lot of traffic, eventually that aggregate interlock would wear off and you would lose that load transfer from panel to panel. So there's things that we've had to address. And as we talk about some of the maintenance issues uh, in some of the other presentations, I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about that. The other thing is that you sometimes get into issues uh, of load transfer where we had no load transfer and, it, and, and you get the faulting that will occur in a pavement. Load transfer failures. When we started using baskets and dowels and that type of thing, sometimes those don't get in the right place. So we have some joints that might deteriorate because of the load transfer device and how it was placed. or if it, if it, if it uh, rusts off and uh, we lose load transfer that way, we may have to go in and do some type of a retrofit on that. Curling and warping is another thing that we look at a lot and how that affects the, uh, 
the uh, performance of the joint itself in the pavement system. And then finally, uh, some of the things like compression failures and spalling. You know, if you can get on a joint too, or on a pavement too soon, uh, before it's really time to saw it, you can get some spalling that can be a maintenance headache down the road. Uh, also, if you get in compressibles in the joints, one of the reasons that a lot of states still do sealing on their joints is to keep those incompressibles out so that you, uh, as that pavement expands, you don't get the point bearings and start to break the pavement off that way. But oh, as I said, in the last 15 or 20 years, we've really been focused a lot on what we kind of call a new uh, durability type of joint deterioration that's going on that we've scratched our heads about for a number of years trying to figure out exactly what it was. It kind of started with some of that work in 1990 as we were looking at air contents and that type of thing, but we've really narrowed it down to a couple of other things which I'm going to share with you. But we found that a lot of this deterioration especially shows up in many of the municipal type pavements or the urban type pavements where we've got curbs and gutters. We don't have as much drainage as we would free drainage on a highway itself. We see some on highways, but not nearly to the extent that we see in those, uh, those uh, areas where the drainage is not quite as good. As we've looked at that, we've realized that predominantly most of this deterioration that you saw in those last two slides is really occurring in those cold regions where we have a lot of freeze thaw cycles, you know, in the upper Midwest on out towards the East Coast. The types and mechanisms that we've been looking at over the past few years are certainly saturated freeze thaw damage. We feel that's definitely one of the, the conditions that's going on. Uh, we've had some great professors working with us on that. Jason Weiss out of uh, Oregon State, Tyler Lay out of Oklahoma State, uh, Larry Sutter up at Michigan Tech has been involved in a lot of this work. And, uh, and then we've also been working with uh, Tom Van Dam on some of it to try and get a better idea of of uh, how that's uh, performing with regard to some of the databases that are out there and what we can really learn from, uh, from that. But saturated freeze thaw damage is one that we really feel is going on with some of these pavements and we're trying to address what needs to be done to make sure that we mitigate that. The other type or mechanism of joint deterioration that we've really come upon and we think has a lot to do with what we see out there is called the calcium oxalate chloride formation, expansion and damage. It is a chemical reaction that's going on between the, the cement and, the, uh, and the, uh, the icing chemicals that we're using. As many of you know, we've changed the icing procedures tremendously over the last 10 or 15 years. We're doing a lot of brine in some areas of the country. We're doing a lot of uh, brine on pavements that are dry. And uh, we see uh, evidence of some problems with that as we look at the joints, especially when we get a slurry almost that settles into those joints and stays there and saturates the concrete for a long time. The good news is that we're also finding out some things that we think can help mitigate that. Uh, more use of uh, supplemental cementitious materials, uh, using, making sure we keep the water cement ratio low, something that Minnesota's been doing for a number of years, and, uh, and also making sure that we've got the proper air and train void system. So the causes that, we've, that we're focused on, and I've got a couple of publications I'm going to mention at the end if you want more detail on it. The, the causes that we focused on is the saturation, free saw, oxychloride formation, and the sawing practice. Something that's evident in all of these incidents that we're looking at is water. There's a lot of water out there in these pavements. You know, we're sitting in water sometimes. We've got a lot of water going on over the pavements and we know the damage occurs where the concrete doesn't dry out and it's amazing the amount of water that stays in those concretes even though the weather conditions may uh, make you think that it is dried out and it may not be but water needs a space to expand into and that's the reason that we did the air and training and so we want to make sure that we maintain that air entrainment system or that entrained air system in the concrete if we don't have a good concrete, with re and we have a lot of saturations. It can be due to the marginal water cement or mar marginal water cement ratios. If we get the water cement ratio too high, that can create a problem for us as far as the permeability or the uh, of the concrete itself. Marginal air, poor local drainage conditions, or drainage that isn't maintained for that pavement system. That all can lead to rapid saturation, shadowing at your joints, like you see. 
uh, even in the deep cracking, that's it's the same type of shadowing, not the same distress, and then some flaking that occurs with the pavement itself. The other thing that comes along is what's going on with the de-icers. We know that mag chlorides and some of the other chlorides, sodium chloride is probably the safest one out there, but people use a lot of different stuff. And one of the things we found out with these local agencies, especially the cities, they don't have a lot of background in what's in those de-icing chemicals that, they've, that they're using. I think our state DOTs understand that probably a lot better, but as we've worked with some of the cities, uh, we've got one major city or suburb of Des Moines that they have got 12 different recipes that they use on their streets, and it all is based on how the traffic levels on that street and how soon they have to get that ice or snow off of the street. In fact, we talked to one of the maintenance workers, and he said, I can tell you which ones are going to be looking worse as we were out looking at some of those pavements because I know what the, the amount of chemical is that we're putting on those. A lot of them, are again, are brine applications. So uh, certainly, as you can see here from this picture, that mag chloride is drawing moisture into that concrete system, as you can see here. Oxychloride formation, again, this is something that Larry Sutter and Jason Weiss have worked on, and we're learning more and more about that, and uh, it's become quite a, a big project for us. But primar primarily what we have there is uh, calcium oxychloride forms, a uh, combination of the calcium hydroxide that's in the cement and the chlorides from the salts. That material or that can expand up to 30%. Normal freeze thaw freezing, I think, is around six, seven, or eight percent. This is thirty percent, and it can happen up in the forty degree temperature area. So, if you get enough of that material in there, this is part of what we believe is happening to these joints, where we, you know, thirty, forty years ago didn't see that kind of a problem. Another thing that we've looked at, we've addressed, tried to address, is sawing practice. Here you can see that uh, if I'm not going to get into issue of seal, no seal, and we don't have time for that this afternoon. But what we've seen in a lot of indications where we're using backer rods, we got water that's coming up because of subgrade moisture and that type of thing. And we're starting to see this cavitation within the joint itself. And then what you'll see on the pavement top, you're going to start to see a crack maybe three or four inches from the joint, and it's popping off. We've got, we had a section of Interstate 35 north of Ames that we had a, a large amount of that. And so we're having to go in and, and do some partial depth patching on that type of thing because honestly, once we get to the bottom of the joint, the concrete's in pretty good shape. But we've got all that moisture sitting there. A lot of it, if the seals aren't working, a lot of that moisture is uh, heavily laced with the chemical that's sitting there drawing the water in. And so you've got a saturated condition in that concrete almost constantly, 24 hours a day seven days a week, even into the summertime sometimes. So we're trying to address that, looking at, you know what, our objective hopefully is to make sure we've got a joint that's deep enough that it cracks so that some moisture can get down through that joint and, uh, and then not have this cavitation problem. All right, I'm pushing on through here. Some of the things that we've uh, looked at as far as preventing joint deterioration in new pavements, Soil subgrade and base systems, we need to probably look seriously to stabilize subgrade or granular subbase and the drainage of the pavement system. And not only that you are draining the pavement system, but you're maintaining the, the drainage of it. We've seen a lot of instances where we've got subdrains along edges of pavements. We go out and look at the outlets and they're not draining and you'll find that there's something in there. So really what you've done is created a bathtub for that pavement to sit in. Other things that we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, the lower water cement ratios, making sure that we keep those down, uh, supplementary, supplementary cementitious materials such as slag, fly ash, uh, those types of things, well-graded aggregates. We got into some problems a few years ago with gap-graded aggregates that didn't really allow us to maintain the air systems and the, and the uh, a low permeability that we need to have in our concrete, and certainly still we need to have the air void system. Some of the construction practices, curing. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got adequate coverage and application rate. And I know there's several states, you, Minnesota has led in that, the use of the PAMS uh, curing, and I think Wisconsin's using that now and a couple other states that I've run into. Uh, that certainly seems to be having impact on how some of these pavements are, are performing uh, joint-wise. I keep telling the guys in Iowa about that. We maybe need to be looking at that a little 
carefully because I admire what I see on some of your pavements up here in Minnesota. Sawing window, uh, sawing joints, the window and the depth are important in the construction process. Uh, sealing joints, if you seal it, you need to maintain that seal. That's, that's what I'll say about that. And again, I would say you might want to consider a drainable base, especially if you don't seal. Uh, surface sealers, we're doing some research on that as to whether or not that might help us. Uh, not so much maybe in the early construction, but maybe mitigation down the road. Uh, as far as the maintenance is concerned, routine maintenance that would be required to help these joints perform longer is joint cleaning, joint sealing, surface sealers, drainage, winter maintenance. This is just kind of an interesting thing that, that addresses the, the icing a little bit. We looked at, the, there's a site that has a lot of information about the amount of de-icing chemicals that are being used by states. Well, we, Iowa got number one on the brine, and uh, it's 20 million gallons a, a year of calcium chloride brine. That seems like a lot of material that's going down on those pavements. And New York, actually, uh, they still do uh, the broadcast, you know, not the brine, but just the uh, salt itself, the sodium chloride, 920,000. 866 tons on a system of about 43,000 miles. So we know that that's out there. We have to respond to it in the future. So the game has changed. Water has to be prevented from saturating the concrete. Permeability of the concrete should be as low as possible. The air void system and the in-place concrete must be adequate. The lessons that we've learned are a significant change seems to be the de-icing salts, and we have to learn to live with that. Concrete ingredients are also changing. Admixtures and the type of concretes that we have today are changing. We need to make sure we understand how those are working. And we have to acknowledge that safety is paramount in most instances. And we need to make better concrete that's able to resist the salts by using the air void system, water cement ratio, and the FCM dosage. Just to close out, one of the things that has come out of all of this work that we've done on the, the mechanisms of the joint deterioration is an effort to try and uh, Look at a different way of monitoring or testing our concrete. We have a major pooled fund that's going on right now with like 16 states now are a part of that, where we're looking at what we really feel are the things that matter. Uh, an NC squared group, five or six states out of the NC squared started this a number of years ago, and we established that there were six things that we really needed to look at. It wasn't just slump and error. Uh, what we need to be concerned about is the permeability of the transport properties of the, can of the concrete the aggregate stability, the type of aggregate using, uh, the gradation of the aggregate, the strength of the concrete, the cold weather resistance, the shrinkage if we're working in drier locations, and the workability. All those need to be taken into consideration. So in short, what we're trying to do is move towards a lower water cement ratio, uh, considering a 0.4 or less target, adequate air entrainment of 5 to 8%, with 5 being the minimum in place, SCMs, uh, you know, class C or class F fly ash or a combination of fly ash and slag, well graded aggregates and the use of chemicals appropriately. So, as I mentioned, there are a couple of publications that have been put out by the CP Tech Center and Federal Highways. Uh, so we're involved in some of this. One is a guide to prevention and restoration of early joint deterioration, a joint performance guide, and then there's two uh, uh, what we call map briefs that deal with some of this through two or three page. Uh, publications that are available on the CP Tech uh, website. So uh, if you need more information, there it is. I'm going to, you're next, Tom. John, is he going next? Uh, yeah, John's next. But we, so we can just do it all and then get questions, or uh, how are you want to do it? I'm done. Maybe, how about five minutes? Uh, take five minutes for I got to show this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would you, you did reference the mid-depth scarring which uh, we observed. Right, I, I didn't hear what you said. I said you did mention the mid-depth scarring. Yes. Uh, we observed in, in the joint. Yes. Yeah, so yes. We associated that with the statement that was falling in. Mm -hmm. We did observe that from here and the mid -depth. Mm -hmm. and then only a few minutes later. Well, there's no drainage at all. Well, that's the observation. That, that's our, that's one of the reasons we're recommending a, some kind of a drainable place on it. Or if we've got conditions where we had a drain system that was plugged, yeah. if it's gone, we think a lot of that water that's, that's showing up in that scouring is not necessarily so much of the water that's coming down into the joint, but some of it may be 
water that's coming up from the subgrade and sitting in that, and then we get kind of a pumping action there that's drowning that out. We, we believe that it's a historic uh, terrace, but we do have the load application, and there is a relief of the load. Mm -hmm. There is no immediate relief of the pressure. Right. So there is a negative pressure from this. And on that negative pressure, you can have such calculations. Yes, yes. And yeah. that, you know, that, yeah. that, that now, what's some of that stuff gets to be pretty severe when you look at it? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Say, so, Gordon, are you just yep. seeing under the, the joint that you're talking, a drainable base, or is it the whole slab? I, I'm probably saying the whole slab. I don't know that we've looked in. You know, we kicked that around and whether there was a way that we could do that very easily, but but generally I think the approach that we've looked at so far is probably the whole slab. I don't know. We've been trying. We've been, yeah, been doing some we've joint, joint, joint that. Yeah. And maybe you guys can mention that. But yeah, I if we could do it, it'd be great. You know, yeah. I just went from a constructability standpoint and everything, I'm not sure that we've got too excited. Well, we've come back to replace the pipe, you know, and move the material out of the you know, you could kind of strategically plan that, yeah, yeah. but it's going to cost you. Right, right, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up, Tom's going to talk about the uh, aggregatement and repair product evaluations. The best of both worlds. They set in three or four hours and they last quite a while. So really, so we've done a number of product evaluations at the mineral facility here to look at, you know, what are the, some successful products that we can use. So I'll go over those some of those today once we get it in presentation mode here. Okay. All right, so uh, we're actually somewhat fortunate, you know, we don't want joint distress, but actually min road sections were built back in the early 90s, and those are kind of our dark period for performance of our mixes. Uh, they had higher water cement ratios, not as good as aggregate systems. So we actually experienced very similar conditions to what we see in some of the rest of our network. And so again, we started, this is starting to show up right about the same time that, you know, about 18 years, we start seeing, again, this kind of surface deterioration. Now, Bernard mentioned something about cavitation. We also had sections that we saw this phenomenon going on. And again, from the surface, everything looks fine. And, and there may be projects like that out there where, you know, joints look great, but lurking below is this distress and as we're doing projects we get a combination of both surface distress and bottom distress 
And some of the questions is how do you how do you fix something like this? Well, once you start coming in and start doing partial to, partial depth repairs and milling down, you might end up with a big void at the bottom. The short term fix, and I don't know if we still do this practice, we'll actually fill it up halfway to with sand to support a partial depth. It's not the best practice, but if you're looking for three to five year, you know, a shorter term fix, that's one possibility. A lot of times the partials are turned into full depth. It's just a better practice that if you want it to go 10, 15 years, you're gonna have to take the whole joint out. But I just want to kind of point out this this is what happens in some of those joints. And and that's not really this is not what we're talking about when I'm talking about the, the product evaluations that we did at Minroad. So again, we're looking at, at partial depth repairs. And back in 2011, again, we started, it was about year 18, we started seeing all this and we thought, well, let's gather materials, ask people for donations, let's you know, do some playing around. So again, we filled 93 joints with 22 different materials. Some of those included asphalt because we do use asphalt for repairing some of the, the distress as well. Again, we asked anybody that wanted to donate project Products. We also found stuff just laying around uh, that had been offered by suppliers. Some of it was a little older, you know, so we didn't know, but we 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 had a lot of holes to fill, so we filled it in as with all these products. And when we didn't have enough different products, we actually just used ready mix, which of course it's a very difficult to use. But again, we just had so many repairs to do. We we pulled a truck in and just went from hole to hole. And then again, we, we kept track of it. We kind of turned into research, you know, how, how are these things performing? And two years ago, I finished a report. It's available on the web there. You can uh, uh, kind of look at the performance. And I'll just briefly go over what, you know, how things turned out. So again, this is our standard practice for MnDOT is to use a rotary head mill. Again, these are for partial depths. So you just bring it in and remove what you see at the top, a little bit on the edge, it creates a nice rugged surface. And then we come and it's very important to get it very clean and then use sandblasting to get a lot of surface area to bond to. The bonding is really the key to making these things last. So again, the installation is fairly straightforward. One of the things for if you have a cementitious type material, we have had good luck with uh, using kind of a, a mortar, you know, kind of a cement sand prime mortar and wet the you want to get it to really stick to the, the clean uh, prepared surface. Grout's probably a better word. A grout, okay. Yeah, grout. Yeah, okay. And then uh, it's very important to reestablish your, your working joints or cracks again. So again, this this uh, repair here on the right hand side was done with ready mix. Again, it's difficult because it had larger aggregates, not really designed to be a for a small area, but we're, it's difficult, but you can do it. And uh, that's one of our workers are putting it in on the left hand side. And then again, we also had the suppliers put their materials in. Sometimes you want them to do it because, you know, if things don't work out, they kind of blame you and said, well, you didn't install, right? We said, okay, fine, you install it, and we'll monitor it. And you can see some of them, the, the, the people on the right did uh, decide to reestablish a joint. The people on the left put their pot in. They did not reestablish the joint. So it was done both ways. So this is just a list of the products that we had laying around or used. Um, we didn't have a real sound plan planned out later. I'll talk about the, our effort we did last year. But in this case, uh, we just kind of threw them in various holes. And you can see, again, we had a lot more cementitious products than we had. We had a few epoxy type base products that we also, and then also some asphalt products. So, you didn't have any outdoor products like Tech Not in this round, no. Again, we had some spray patch out of a, like a blower, blow patch machine. But in this case, uh, last year we did, and I'll, I'll come to that later. So some of the performance parameters, of course, it's kind of important. Is it going to be loaded or not? So again, location is it, be, you know, it might be a little easier to, to patch something on the center line where it's not being hit by tires all the time. Also traffic, again, we can compare our driving versus passing lane is about 80, 20% traffic split. As far as condition, um, 
we created a subjective scale, anywhere from zero, meaning at the end of the three year period, we, we monitor, monitored these for three years. If it was gone and replaced by asphalt patch or something, it was a zero, and if it was five, if it was still there and it still looked new, and we, we had both. And then of course, bonding again is very important. Um, early on, we didn't really monitor bonding, but uh, near the end, again, we took carefully took a ball peen hammer and just sounded if it sounded hollow or, or even if you could break it off, you know, that's kind of the test. So then this is just part of uh, the evaluations. It's not all of it, but again, you can see kind of starting in February 2012, even by that time, again, these are installed in 2011, some were already down to a two. So, you know, some of them were already missing material, but others, you know, went along pretty well. And again, we just systematically, periodically went out and evaluated these things. And so in the report also is a photographic, you know, we took photographs as we also did the, the distress surveys. So you can kind of see progressively how these things performed over time. So again, I don't have really time today to get into specifics, but um, he had to put up names, you know, but uh, these are the ones that actually performed well and, and were at least on a four out of the five ranking at the end of the, the three year uh, period of analysis. So <laughs> the best performing is ready mix, which again is not practical to use, but I, yeah, I mean, it, and it's slow and, and nobody's really going to use ready mix, but yeah. on, you know, if you're slow and do it right, it makes sense that it's compatible with the existing pavement, which is an important parameter. Uh, Paveman was, was one of the cementitious ones that actually did well. And then this propoxy also did very well, and that's an, an epoxy based uh, rapid set. So, 3U8 TCC 3U teen is our standard, and uh, you know it continues to perform well. And then, hot mix asphalt works if, if you roll it. You know, not the throw and goal that we see see a lot, but if if you put it in there and, and you compact it well, it will stay, and it actually makes a good, a very good patch. How many hours was it taking uh, to get opening strength ready mix? We were not monitoring it. We had, we had time. We had the, yeah, so we did not. This was a kind of a rude and crude experiment at the time. So we were getting a little more scientific as we go through with our efforts. And the other thing, when you had other, I mean, you said some, uh, some of the uh, suppliers or vendors weren't uh, forming the joint. Mm -hmm. Were they all using similar surface prep uh, uh, with uh, milling and yeah, we we prepared the holes and they installed their products. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Tom? Yes. The list that you have there, is that the amount of time that you took to sending in order in terms of performance or not really? Yeah, somewhat, I would say yes. But again, you know, we try not to, again, because of the subjectivity and some of these only had one hole where they had the product, it's really not fair to you know, rank anything. Again, you can look at the report and look at the photos, but again, you have to be very careful. It wasn't a real scientifically laid out experiment. It was, let's throw it out there, see how it does, you know, get some information at this point. And then in terms of curing of these various products, were they cured uh, based on the manufacturer's recommendations or were they just all cured the same? It, it varied. I think a lot of them we put plastic over because we had, again, we had time, we had the, this was on the main line. We had traffic off of it for a week. So we would use plastic, mostly plastic with water, you know, water it down, put plastic and keep it on for several days was kind of the curing method. Not, you know, no, no curing compounds. And of course your epoxy based ones would just, they don't need the curing. So, so at the end, uh, we had 55 of the 93 were still in good serviceable condition after three years of service. Now that's not a lot of time, but uh, we didn't find the location of the patch didn't seem to make that much difference on performance, whether it was in the wheel path or in the center line. Uh, again, certain materials were installed by a supplier. Some were not, you know, they didn't fall and they didn't reestablish the, the joint that did have an impact on some of the, uh, the performance. But again, each material type, whether it's cementitious, epoxy, or hot mix, you know, there was some good and some poor performing. So again, 
you know, your even your where you you guess to do your milling, you might miss a little bit, and you're going to lose the edge or something like that. So again, now before I, I'd also like to mention another material that we've been kind of experimenting back back in 2015 was the use of roller compacted concrete as a, a patching material. Uh, just for the fact that you know the very nature of it, you could throw it in and you could load it early because you're kind of just compacting it further. You know, when you're talking about a very small area, it has it has nowhere to go. Now you you don't want to be doing long panels where you might get into some flexural cracking, but it's actually been a very good material. It's, it's a little tricky to place, uh, as a, I'll show you in the next slide. But again, this has actually been working pretty well, and it's kind of a neat concept, and we're continuing to kind of experiment with it as as a material. For those of you who aren't familiar with the roller compacted, it's, it's like a zero slump. And again, it's compacted. Typically, if you're going to do a pavement, you're going to want a very high density with a high density paver. In this case, we're using maintenance roller. And that's what you see here is just, just using a small maintenance because we want to mimic what a maintenance crew would have at their disposal. The tricky part is you got to have it, you have to determine the surcharge because as you compact, it'll come down. And it's not a material you can kind of just feather on. You have to, so we actually create a little side form here and put it out and then measure how far the, the compactor pushes it down. And then we can kind of use that to judge how to fill in the hole. Now, if you had the, if you're fortunate after repairs that you can come back and diamond grind, then this is not an issue. But we were, we did not have diamond grinding after our repairs. But it, it's actually performing pretty well. Um, our next challenge will be uh, again to to try this with dowel bars because right now that none of these patches had any kind of load transfer um, going going across it. So here's a photograph on the low volume road of one of these, and this is right before we we're going to tear it out because we're re replacing this particular test section. But it was in very good condition after three years. You can see all the all the concrete around is cracked, so. It was put in a very broken up area, but it, it actually uh, held up very well. Now, last year, as part of the National Road Research Lines, uh, Jerry this morning showed some of the, the patching material evaluation that's going on. This was done in a little bit more scientific method in the fact that it, it was done uh, very systematically. But again, 162 uh, locations were repaired, 17 different materials. Again, a lot of them were um, installed by suppliers. And it ends up to be a lot of work to put all these stuff in. And then again, this will be very systematically uh, monitored for performance. So if you, if you want details on some of the, the products, that, again, it's included in the, in the, in the new construction report that's, that's no, uh, now available. So this round, again, we have a mixture of cementitious epoxy uh, petroleum based hot mastic asphalt so we have a little bit different mix of, of materials than we did back in 2011 and like I said we had a pretty systematic pattern so that every every product this time got the same amount of uh, locations as well as the same number of holes um, not every not every uh, test cell was laid out because of the distress in the pavement um, but again, all of these areas with it for each mix got filled up. I would say that actually the pavement was uh, in fairly good condition, even some of the joints, but we, again, we went in again and just brought in a mill machine and created very exact similar locations for each one of these things. So again, we're evaluating whether it's on the, in a wheel path, even in the middle, mid, mid lane, or a full joint across. Again, these are all partial depth repairs. So I was just out there last week taking photos, and you can see uh, the performance of some of the, again, this is after one winter. The one on the left, you can see some cracking. I'm not sure. There was some report that some of this cracking occurred almost immediately. So whether that happened immediately or, or over the winter, uh, I've seen this type of cracking before. It, it'll actually, it doesn't look good, but it'll actually stay there. And again, they, they reestablish the joints. And here's another one on the right-hand side. You can see a little bit of cracking. Um, I wasn't involved 
out there, but you know, as you can see on the right hand side, some of this stuff was pretty hard to work with. It might set, it set pretty quick enough where they couldn't really get it put in there very well. But here's some others that actually, you know, are, are still doing very well, look very good. Again, on the right hand side is again, kind of an epoxy based system. Very smooth texture on that one. Uh, some of the asphalt products, I think this is like um, kind of an aqua patch or something, didn't quite do as well. This, and the, that's on the left hand side. The right hand side is your hot mix asphalt. Again, if it's rolled, it, it really stays in there pretty well. And here again, some of the, some of the material that was laid out here. So again, it's quite early. This stuff was just put down last year. But some of the potential issues that people have been, you know, kind of questioning about this is, you know, we, we our initial attempt was to have just our maintenance crews put it out there, but all of a sudden people start showing up their materials with special mixers or, you know, ways of doing it. So how practical? Will that be for somebody for a maintenance crew to actually install some of this stuff? Um, you know, how, how expensive is that going to be? And then also people say, well, okay, if I got some kind of a gummy, I call it gummy, but an epoxy, is that going to be an issue when they come to grind this or you know, is it going to contaminate it as a recycled product? So people are kind of questioning, I don't know, does does anybody have any experience with some of these materials causing problems with milling machines. Or, I don't know. But, you know, that's that's some of the issues that have to be concerned with. Now, next month we're going to continue our work. We still have other. We have to keep the the sections open, and we still have deteriorating sections. So, in this case, we're actually going to combine uh, evaluating some materials along with. Um, Evaluating for uh, early opening. So again, some of the experiment is how early can you open your patch without causing long-term damage? So we're going to be using our standard 3U18, uh, 3U58, and then also another high early for the full. So this going to be a combination of partial and full depth repairs. And then on a couple of the panels that are really tough shape, we're going to fully remove them. And again, we're going to try this roller compacted concrete. Again, this time with doll bars, you know, realizing we may not get full consolidation around the doll bars, but in, in any respect, we, we we're interested in, in full panel replacements where you do have some load transfer in there. And that's something, I, I don't know that anybody's done that before, but we're going to, again, we're out to push the envelope and try daring stuff. We're also going to try internal cure mix. We've also, we've heard from Jason Weiss that that might be a good practice. We're going to be evaluating that. And again, we're going to be doing this kind of systematic early loading where we're going to hit it almost too early and then we'll systematically keep loading it as it gets older until we get to full depth, uh, full strength. Oops, wrong one. So I'd just like to finish by acknowledging all the suppliers and installers that helped us get all this uh, products in over the years. and. Uh, you know, it's it's great to go out there and play around with them. And again, we can we can take the risks that some some DOTs or agencies can't. You know, if these things fail, we have the option of again switching traffic. And and we're fairly uh, liquid, uh, fluent in how fast we can kind of take care of a repair that falls apart too soon. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. Two questions. Yes. Tom, do you have a design strategy in mind for the material that you wanted to put into this rather than just a uh, canvas, what anybody wants to give you and try? No. <laughs> Again, we're, our, the, 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 the effort last year was we're trying to get newer products, not the tried and true tested stuff. So again, we're trying to evaluate, bring us your magic potions and then but, but I would think you want to have a design that says, you know, what I'm going to put in here is going to have less shrinkage or less thermal expansion and contraction because otherwise it's probably going to pop right back out. I want something that is inherently tougher than what I'm putting it on so that, you know, 
because what was there was pretty brittle and it fell out. Mm -hmm. you know, something like that, so that you don't end up putting somebody's special goo in there that turns out to be nothing but bubble gum. And you, you, you wasted your time and effort when you could have sorted and screened at least the first cut to say, look, guys, I mean, we realize everybody wants to do business with the DOT, but from a design standpoint, these seem to be the types of things we're looking for, so we're not wasting the time and effort. You know, we, we have our three UA team, which we're very, very satisfied with. I mean, that's tried and true. It's not the fastest setting one. So I think the envelope was most of the stuff we did last year was very fast, high early stuff. And again, that's the stuff we don't trust that it's going to last, right? We have, so that, that's the focus of the effort was bring us your, yeah. What I would add is that it wasn't anyone wanted to give us something. I would say that we worked with um, the rigid group, worked with the Venomania yeah. group, worked with the IBGA. And we worked with the DOT, the member states, and said which ones have you had experience with, which ones would you like to try. And then some of the manufacturers, I think, who were associate members too, or gave associate mm -hmm. members, I'm not sure, all the details, but we put there was thought put into it and there was a process to it. It's more than like you said, the first time the research was done, anyone who you know, people send a sample of the products all the time. Well, what do we have? You know, this is right here on the shelf. Let's yeah, try that's, it out. Yeah, yeah. This last one, I would say, and Brett or John could correct me differently, but that's what I recall. We actually, 90% of the people that provide a product for the partial death repair experiment are IDPA members. And uh, we've had several calls in the preservation group about how we were going to approach the PDR project. Whether we're going to go uh, totally hurt each manufacturer's recommendation or whether we were going to go in more of a throw and go. And we ended up leaning towards the throw and go. I mean, I made it my, own, my personal uh, job <laughs> to contact every one of my members and say, listen, if you're getting involved with this, we're looking at three to five years, minimal prep, and here are the steps that are going to be taken. And I did that in a personal phone call and then followed up with each of them with a letter making sure that they didn't want to cut my head off at the end of this thing, right? So they knew what the parameters were. And there's there's only two or three that were not members that were involved that I, I don't know if they got that same level of communication, but I made it a point to, to save my own skin at the end of this thing just to be sure that they were clear. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was sitting back there. I thought one of the things that you got to remember, if you do this at a modal level, you're talking about an agency employee. You need to have this pretty simple and straightforward. If the return takes a PhD to operate, but you've got a problem. It's, it's got to be really simple and easy when the guy just goes through this and this and this and go. What's the problem? They all look, especially rigid materials, it takes great attention to detail to get have success. And a partial duct repair with a rigid material, I was kind of surprised that there was no isolation with some of your initial tests because everything I understand about a partial duct repair is it doesn't have a chance of success if you have a joint that's moving and you don't isolate them. So, yeah, and again, so a lot of that has to do, and it has to do with DOT culture too, you know, as far as the time and effort really that it takes to have. A successful repair, and that's why some maybe alternative options that you don't have to isolate that have a little flexibility that will move might be a better option for some DOTs. Yeah. Now, uh, all of this was installed by one contract, right? No. So this was not that was the initial. Good. The initial intent was that our maintenance crews would install everything, but then I think things changed as the suppliers started showing up okay. with special mixers. There was various mixers and. And some were sandblasted, some were not. Okay, yeah. And basically, they were told up front what the deal was. And it was supposed to be all done by a district crew maintenance. Yeah. Crews. There's supposed to be a, a contractor hired on to do the milling to create the, right. the full repair area. And then a district crew was going to do the install with guidance on the side by the, the uh, vendors. But somehow, <laughs> some of the vendors brought their own, you know, shear mixers and things fell apart a little bit, but it's all documented in the report. Yeah. So you have a clear idea of if there is material that was put together with a rotary mixer and was sort of a throw and go with no sandblast, you're going to know that. Yeah. But some of the rules got bent along the way, like it happens in the industry. 
Well, one thing I forgot to mention again, these are like three to five year fixes. These are not the 15 to 20 year fixes. So this is a very rapid, you know, as rapid as you can put it out there, open the traffic and have it last three, buy time for five years. So again, we like our 318 process. It's a slower process, but those things stay what? Is it 15 years? Uh, we think 12. 12, okay. <laughs> but still, that, that's a significant enough time. Yeah. yeah so. Here's one, uh, one more comment about rigid material. If it fails, bomb, it can come out in chunks. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. really creates a safety. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. another thing to consider. But we don't see. We just, if they're done probably by a good contractor, and again, this paste is part of the key too, right? Grout, yeah. yeah, the the, the priming grout. Actually, our spec actually allows them to use the water for the grout except for 318 based upon some research that he shot and for mm -hmm. um, Because some of the proprietary stuff says the water is fine. Yeah. So we said it's up to you, and, but we have the warrant, we have 30 day warrant. So after it's either ground or the repairs and it's open back to traffic, after the repairs are completed, they, we have 30 days to go back and review them if they didn't fail. Even if they put traffic on it, then they have to repair it at no cost to us. So bonding, better to do it right the first time, whichever way for material. Our experience in Missouri is that surface prep and restoring joint of prep overshadows the yeah, things up there on one of the <laughs> Maria is next. She's the closing act. Yeah. Bring your lighters. You have seven minutes, maybe one extra, because we got a layer start. You only got how many slides you got? Thirty. How many? Oh, yeah, I've been watching. This one had 30, and this one had 25, too. So I, <laughs> even though I had 10 minutes like them. We could go a little longer. No, I don't have to. This is Maria Maston. Everybody should know who Maria is. Chairperson of the National Concrete Consortium. Very knowledgeable. Going to talk about the study you did on a I mean, I know Minnesota's had a lot of issues with their basket shifting and moving around. In this research, and she's going to talk about kind of what they found and what they did. All right. Well, I am the six minutes person, so we'll see how far I could go. Two slides a minute. <laughs> well, four slides a minute. All right. So today I'm going to talk about findings from a study on Dalbar anchorage and full depth concrete repairs. So not necessarily related to new construction, although we're applying it to new construction, more so related to our concrete pavement rehabilitation. So kind of give you a little bit of background uh, for years. I mean, I think since the mid 80s, we've been doing full depth concrete pavement repairs and have generally had really, really good success. Well, we came to a point where we thought, hmm, you know, you only need three dial bars and not even necessarily depending on traffic, three dial bars per wheel path for um, dial bar retrofits. So could we take dial bars out of our full depth repairs and see the same performance? And so we uh, had went from our 11 bar full depth repairs to six bar full depth repairs on a couple projects. And one of those happened to be Interstate 90. And so the contractor came in and they did their full depth repairs. And uh, within, after the first winter, we were getting phone calls already saying the roads fault, you know, they're feeling a thump, 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 thump already. And so we went out and did some investigation on it. And just kind of wanted to show you in the upper corner, no mouse here. Can you see that? Nope. All right. Well, the upper left corner, that is the longitudinal. And so you can see how that panel actually was sunk. And then this is the view um, and the joint going across horizontally. That's the longitudinal joint there. And so, and then this is just a, um, a view with our pavement management equipment. And so you can see the full depth repair here and here. And you could actually see from this is the longitudinal profile, you could actually see that that full depth repair had shifted. And uh, this joint happened to have six dollar bars in it. And actually all of them on this project did. So to give you a bit of an idea, uh, this project is, is down in District 
7, but it's on Interstate 90. We put six dial bars in. It had 25.4% trucks in it. So that's that's a good number of trucks. Uh, average daily traffic, 7,668. So uh, what this data is showing you is on the left side is the IRI. So this is from our pavement management data. And every line is just every um, mile in this segment of roadway to give you an idea. So in 2007, which is the first data point, the IRI averaged between 120 and 150. 2009 was the peak before we did the repairs, and it was anywhere from 155 to 195. We came in and we did our full depth repairs, and in 2010, those full depth repairs brought us back down into the 70 to 85 inches per mile. Then uh, two years later, we're almost back up into the 180s. And so that's not what we expect when we do our full depth repairs. Um, pretty confidently, we get 15 to 20 years with full depth repairs in our performance. So this was very frustrating to us. So we started doing some more investigation on it. And so this is what we found. We ended up bringing the FWD out there and we did some load transfer testing on Interstate 90. And this is an example of three of the different joints that we tested. So you can see in the top one, joint C1, we took the cores right at the edge, a line adjacent to the joint, right over one of the dowel bars. And you can see the FWD testing was at 50% load transfer. All right. That's right. So if you look at the left picture where it says surface side, you can see that even though when we anchor dowel bars, we should have material all the way around them, flush with them, that there actually you could see no material. And this was within two years of when it was constructed. There was really no material there. You can see the surface from the joint, away from the joint. So this would have been the back side of it. You can see there is still a gap in there, but there is some surface material. You, uh, the next one we looked at, joint C4, and you can see there is pretty, it was 75% load transfer, and it had pretty good material on each side of that um, core. And then the final one in the lower uh, part of the picture with joint C5, that one tested out at 10% load transfer. And remember, this is two years old. And you could see that we pushed the dowel bar right out of it, and the epoxy was already coming off of the dowel bar. So really not what we wanted. So was it an isolated incident? Was it just because we used six dowel bars? Wow, what was the deal? So we went out and we investigated five other projects. And in general, uh, our specs allow epoxy or grout as an alternative for the anchoring material that we found every single project had some lack of epoxy or grout around the dowel bars. And um, this quote is actually from uh, Gordy Brune, who works for me and who was in construction for 18 years, many CPR projects. And he says, I watched them, you know, I watched them get installed on many projects and I thought they were good. You know, just standing there and looking it all seemed like it was good. They were using material, they put the bars in, and we were good to go. So with our concerns, we had done a few projects with eight dial bars, one with six. Uh, we decided that we needed to go back to 11 dial bars due to the problems we had encountered with the workmanship. So whether we truly do need 11 dial bars or not, just because of workmanship, we went back to that. And we said, all right, well, it's time to discuss this with the concrete industry and talk to our inspection people. So in December of 2012, we had an agency industry meeting. And we really, we focused, our discussion was focused on this one project where we had these pretty significant failures. Um, the, con or the industry's response was it's been working for 30 years. What are we doing any different? Why? What's the big deal now? Why do we have to make a change that happened on one project? Says, well, it happened on a few more, not to the same degree. But in the end, we had a few contractors that, that sat up and said, you know what? It's workmanship and best practice issues. And if, as long as we're doing it the way we're supposed to be doing it, this shouldn't be happening. And so um, that was really good, um, appreciated for me anyways in working with the industry. Uh, it came up to, well, how good can we really do? If we have it under a controlled application, let's figure out 
how well we really can anchor dowel bars in. So uh, Minroad, um, Minroad was our location of choice, and they graciously agreed to help us out. So uh, this is what we did. So we have two phases of investigation. Our first phase occurred in February of 2013. So yes, it's winter in Minnesota. But we had the nice pole barn out there where you guys are going to eat dinner tonight. This is where we did our research at. And so uh, we had a major repair project. And uh, one of the contractors had tons and tons of fold up repair removals just sitting there. So, piece, so one of the contractors hauled some of the slabs in and drilled the holes in for us, set them up there, and we tried all kinds of different methods. We tried uh, several grout methods, the grout box method, dip and stick. Uh, we tried one hour old grout because some people say if the grout gets too old, that's a problem. We tried grout capsules, which are um, a prepackaged uh, material. I, I kind of call it like a, a nicer pantyhose type material. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but that's my comparison at this moment. Uh, filled with all of the material and all you have to do is add the water and let it hydrate a little bit and then you can stuff those in the holes. We did epoxy, dip and stick, we did double dip, fill and twist, and then we tried a polygrip epoxy which is more of a proprietary one. Uh, because it was February we had a few problems with the epoxy um, being able to handle it because it was just so cold out. And then some said, well, there's too much dust in the hole. You know, we can't, we have issues with that. I know Wisconsin uses grout rings to keep the material in the hole. So we tried additional brushing. Uh, we tried compressed air and we tried grout rings. And so the people that were doing this work are the contractors who are out there bidding the jobs and are the superintendents for their projects. So they're the ones here trying to show us, um, trying to give us the best we can get. And so this is just kind of a picture of, of all of the different methods we were using in, in the installations. You can see in the picture the second one from the left at the top that every other dowel bar we had the grout ring on them. So that we were same installation, same material, but we were able to compare the different choices. The third picture from the left at the top, that's a grout capsule. And so basically the length of the capsule, we cut them in half, saturate them. And then we stuff those into the holes. The cool thing about them is we know the materials in there with all the other methods we are putting in material not knowing how much goes in there where this is there. The tough part is, is we have to hammer on the dowel bar to get it in there because the hole's full of all the material. But that's really the promise of it. So um, we know contractors are doing this. They take out the epoxy and they wrap it around and then they stuck them, stick them in and things like that. So. We tried every different method. So what did we do from there? Maria, with the crop capsule, is that that sleeve, does that go into the hole too? Yep. Doesn't yep. that cause the bind to be? Nope. Nope, because we cut a hole in one end of it. And so we're pushing it in. So as we're pushing the bar in, the material's coming out of that sleeve. So the sleeve really doesn't seem to do anything from what I can tell. I don't know, John, have you looked any closer at them? So. You know you have application on 100% surface. Yep. The thing that concerns you is when we go back to the hammer on the other end. Yes. They put all that work to get epoxy on 100% of the bar and send it off. Yes. So that, yes. But I'd rather have them anchored than have epoxy on them. <laughs> yep. So uh, what happened after that is we wanted to see how well um, the material actually got into the hole with all our different methods. So the contractor came back out and you can see in the left picture over there that they sawed off uh, part of the slab so that we could actually go in and see the dowel bars. And so in the top, these were three different materials. I didn't identify them. Um, three different applications though. and so. Um, we were fortunate with the University of Minnesota that they have the mirror device. And so they came out and they used the mirror and they put that on top of every different, um, every single dowel bar application. And so you can see on, if we start with the one on the very right, that one had complete coverage visually around the dowel bar. And you can see that in the, that middle picture, the blue picture, that there is no, 
there is no appearance of any differences. You know, it's looking for error voids, and it didn't find any when we had full coverage. If you go back to the middle one and to the left one, you can see that kind of that round, well, that red blob in the middle with the green around it. That represents the dowel bar, but you can see the blue between that and the, the bottom flat part is basically the ground. You can see that there are voids in there. And so what we found was that um, some of them really worked well and some of them didn't. And I can tell you that the very one on the right I know is the anchoring capsule. So, All right, so this is what we learned in the field. So phase two, Minroad, uh, full depth repair of the old main line. That's the part that you guys will not be on today during your tour because that is open to traffic right now. What we did, though, is we uh, went out there and we said, okay, we know which methods we like, we know which methods we hate. Um, uh, the contractors still kind of said, well, but it's been working for years. You know, what can we do? So we went out there and there's a segment of roadway. I think it's between cell 19 and 15 or 16 or so. And we put in one inch and one and a quarter inch diameter dowel bars. And so we tried several different methods. So we used no grout. So the holes were drilled and we just poked the bars in. We used a modified grout bag. And so that's the upper right corner picture. I know it's a little difficult to see, but basically it's like a frosting bag. So a bag and then you fill the grout in and then you squeeze it into the hole as you go. And then the bottom right is that grout capsule. So on the left you can see it in its form, and then in the right, I know they're a little difficult to see, but you can see it bubbling. So it bubbles up, and I think two minutes is what sticks in my mind how long they get soaked, and then they get taken out and stuffed into the hole. So we had our controlled location. Um, Minroad has been so kind to do um, seasonable FWD testing for us so we can see if there's changes in load transfer and deflection. Uh, we really haven't done much any coring of it yet. Um, our hope was to have like a five-year study and Minroad's been accommodating to help us with that and monitoring it over time. So to give you an idea just of traffic, what it was construct constructed on was nine inches of joint and reinforced, over six inches of classic space and clay, 13% uh, trucks, and um, since the test section installations, and this only goes back to 2016, uh, the average or the rigid Cecils that have been on that pavement are 800 or let's 1.7 million Cecils. Uh, so it's a good amount of traffic. And uh, normally it's got traffic 25% of the year, would you say, give yeah. or take, yeah. um, because of some other construction activities. Uh, in 2016, there was a large amount of traffic on it because of work that was being done on the other lane. But a lot of traffic, more than a lot of our roads. So what were we trying to figure out is we wanted to know with real traffic what kind of um, load transfer efficiency we were seeing with these different methods and what kind of deflection. And so as I read, typical action thresholds are from 50 to 70 percent for load transfer efficiency. And uh, the maximum differential deflection criteria Larson and Smith published of 5 mils max may help evaluate dowel looseness. So these were our guides that we were using as we've evaluated it. And so this is what we've done. So this, I know, is a very busy slide. Uh, and so all of the different test methods or all the different applications are on the lower bottom. In the upper right corner, you can see the blue rectangle. That's where the FWD just dropped my mind, the drop. That's where the drop, right? The load plate. See, it tripped my mind. Thank you. That's where the load plate sat, and traffic is going to the right. And so this um, data represents load transfer efficiency from the approach pavement, and I have a line drawn in the left axis of 70% LTE. The very left bar is blue in each one of the different cells, and that was pre-full um, depth repairs occurring, and the second one is one month after the first reading. And that was post. So you can see after the repairs were done, every one of them went above that 70%. Otherwise, load transfer was 20 to 30% out there on all of the joints. What I want to point out is the very right joint is the control. 
So we didn't do anything. That, those are still what it was before we did any repairs to the rest. The other two circled ones is no grout, one and one and a quarter inch diameter dowel. And then the grout dip and stick is the other one that is circled more in the middle. And so what I wanted to show you with all the data is those are the three that really have fallen off on their load transfer efficiency in a very short time, which told us that we like the, the grout bag application and the grout capsule and the epoxy seem to be performing also. So I'm just going to kind of go through quicker with these last few slides. Uh, the load plate is shifted onto the repair. We did not have pre-test data on this location. But you can see, once again, the load transfer efficiency for the dip and stick and the no grout went down quite a bit. Uh, shifting that load plate over again, uh, same thing, no control. The no grout and the grout dip and stick were starting to drop below. You can see, though, that with the larger diameter dollar bar, um, that the load transfer efficiency is hanging in there better than um, with the one inch bars. Uh, this is uh, shifted one more, and so we have the control again, and then we have the pre and the post, but once again, it's those same three that are just not staying in the game. Differential deflection, uh, same entire process, but I have circled those same three again to show you. That's the five mils max for dowel bar looseness, and you can see that all the other applications are doing really well. The blue, once again, is before the repairs were done except the controls almost to the max. Doing nothing was better than drilling holes and putting dial bars in with no grout. So do nothing may be better, but I'd still rather have one of these. So, And just I'm just walking you across the data again to show you the ones that um, we have more issues with. And then the final piece of data that we have is payment smoothness. We did not. Um, Mineral has collected this data also. We did not get readings prior to doing the repairs, so we've kind of picked up on this later. I circled the ones that we had the concerns with, but we're not seeing a lot of change with the traffic or the smoothness, but I don't know what it was right after the repair either. There was no grinding or, or texture. This was diamond ground. So, so in a nutshell, that's um. That's quickly what we've done. Our current specs allow um, grout bag, um, grout capsules, and then epoxy. And what we do on every job now is they have to do it. They cut a repair. They have to install in whatever method they're going to do and require them to core through the dowel bar to demonstrate that their method actually got material in the holes. And then we'll allow them to continue on. And we have random coring after that. And we've had projects random coring where there's been no material and so we've gone back. We've even retrofit a full depth repair. So we couldn't have done this without the concrete industry and research. We did, we did this with no money. Everything was donated and, and then all of our times were put into it. So um, that's why there's no report yet because I haven't done it. But um, it'll come. Research is helping me, and they've helped me in the past. But then that's it. So thanks. Ben says yes. Thanks for being here, because I wouldn't have known that answer. All right. They, we only put them in the wheel on the wheel tracks, I think. Yes. For the experiment. For the experiment, not yes. Standard, not yeah, not for our standard, but we yeah. really we were just checking the efficiency of the the anchoring material around the bar, so we did not put them across the entire joints. So you're still sticking with the eleven. Back to the 11. We're back with the eleven, and I. I'm 99% sure we went to one and a quarter inch diameter dowel bars where we were using one inch. And we also require them to have an eighth inch size larger, a hole that's an eighth inch size larger than the dowel bar, which some of the contractors are mad at us for. But it's like, <laughs> I didn't want to be prescriptive, but we had problems, so we had to be more prescriptive. So. 
Yes. Do you worry about the, the drill bits wearing out too and then the amount of drought that gets around that? Yeah, we are worried about the drill bits wearing out. So we've been educating the inspectors on checking them often and then checking the diameter across the hole. So, But you know what? If they get lax, we're taking the core. And so we take that core and their performance is right there, whether or not they're doing it sufficiently. So. And we've got some contractors, depending on the size of the project, who are using the grout capsules when they're smaller projects. Um, some that prefer the grout capsules. And, you know, I don't see epoxy as much as I see the grouts now as compared to before. So. I need Gordy right here to answer that question for me. I, I don't want to answer wrong, but I think it's just an eighth inch, no matter what. I used the grout this year in the, in the stocking. Mm -hmm. And our contract for the grout was less expensive than the pots. And I think that's true. I think, um, I think we've created a market for these grout capsules, and to my knowledge, there's only one manufacturer of them. And so. You know, you have to weigh it against your resources and your people who are in the field, too. I think that the expertise of the contractors, personnel out there, sometimes the risk and the cost, you know, you have to figure it out. So, but I can't speak for them, but that's why we allow the different methods. Any other questions? We're already 15 minutes behind. So we'll <laughs> All right, oh, thanks, yeah. Maria. You're welcome.